It's so good, you guys. I just got out of the theater with my family to see Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, and it is so good. I polled you guys earlier to see if you had any concerns, so let's talk about those things. I'll give you a spoiler-free review, a little bit of a plot summary, then I'll give you my kids' scores and their takes. To help me with those concerns, let's welcome a returning guest, Past Greg. Hey guys, Past Greg here, coming at you from this afternoon. Going into this movie, I've got a few things I'm concerned about, and some stuff I'm very excited about. Hopefully what you're concerned and excited about is also found here. First, I'm worried that the awesome visuals and cool music Music are going to be covering a thin story. Sequels are really infamous for having a poor story, especially when there wasn't a clear jumping off point from the first movie. Looking at you, Frozen 2. The first Spider-Verse movie was a literal game changer in animation. The vibrancy, playing with the frame rates, uh, adding in the comic bubbles, the comic frames, the little Spider-Sense lightning bolts, the actual comic dots like you would find in the ink. It was so visually appealing and different. Tim, hey, what'd you think about that first movie? I like it. Me too, that's why I'm gonna see it tonight. Then you add in a killer soundtrack that my van was bumping for months after that first movie came out. It would be so easy to coast on those things and the movie would still be just fine and it would make a fortune. Obviously, I'm hoping this one brings the same excellent music and visuals, but I wanna make sure the plot holds up too. The visuals are just as cool and they cranked it up a notch. Bam, bam, bam. Different characters had their own art style, like Hobie or Punk Spider had his very own unique look. Each dimension has its own art style, and I will just say, that comes into play at the end. It was so well done. Sometimes we even have the world reflecting what's going on. In Gwen's world, we have like a painted world. It's very watercolory, and it changes based on her mood. The plot is not thin. They really fleshed out some ideas and really gave you something to think about. They did not rely on just being a sequel to a successful movie. There are real stakes. There is real emotion. There is an incredible story underneath the incredible looking face. I will say the music in this movie is not as good as the first, and that is not a knock to this movie. It's a testament to just how amazing the soundtrack was and how well it was woven into that first movie. When Miles finally jumps out that building and he, and he decides to embrace his response, responsibility and he jumps up there and the entire build up to that moment and he finally leaps off the building and what's up danger is playing and it's a quiet part and then he grabs the web and the music hits oh my god that was such an amazing scene this movie has very good music and it fits the tone of the scenes but we don't have any moments like that one. And that's that's not to, again that, I don't want to say this is a bad movie. I'm just telling you if you were going in thinking that you were going to get that mountaintop again they didn't catch that lightning twice. Another thing that worries me is Miguel. The trailers give me the impression that he's actually like the villain, that he is the tough guy leader of the spiders that wants to do something really drastic that he thinks is going to save the multiverse and he's like the end justifies the means kind of villain and so he and Miles are going to have to fight. Also Spot looks like a goofy sub villain that's just going to be played for laughs and this movie has an over two hour runtime, and I don't think they've got room for goofy side villains. Am I a joke to you? Yeah, that's what I'm worried about. <laughs> oh, past Greg, you naive rube, you imbecile, you simpleton. Spot is legitimately scary at the end. He starts as a joke, does not stay that way. We were right about Miguel though, he is kind of an antagonist doing the whole bad stuff has to happen for the greater good thing. But the movie is so interesting because you leave the theater wondering, was he actually right? The multiverse in this movie looks huge. There are a ton of different spider variations, and we have yet to see a multiverse on screen that didn't feel unwieldy. I think it worked in the first movie because the entire thing takes place on Earth-616, and you just have these side characters, and there were only like six of them. I'm worried that it's going to be confusing. It's, there's going to be too much going on on screen. It's going to be visually confusing. It's going to actually make it boring because there's too much going on. So there are actually only two extra spiders in this movie. All the extra ones that we we saw from the trailer they are part of a big fight scene they stay in the background you can have fun picking them out if you want to but they do not clutter the movie you've got hobie the new spider who is basically joey ramon as spider-man and then you have indian spider whose name is hang on i have it written down pavitur prabhakar never saying that again I probably didn't even say it right that time. They did a really good job with the multiverse. They didn't try to make it a huge thing. I'll explain a little bit more about that in the plot summary. Obviously, we have to ask, what is the message? It's so sad that I have to make this a consideration for every movie I go see, but here we are. You've already seen Gwen's room has a protect trans kids flag they just wanted to insert in there, which is absolutely stupid. Are we going to make Gwen a girl boss in this movie who is just overpowered and amazing and Miles is going to be just a stupid man who has to be led around by her? We saw in the trailer, Miles has a BLM 
sticker on his bag, even though his father is a black police officer. This is a fun reminder not to put relevant messages in your multi-year production movie. We found out last week that BLM was shocking, a scam all along, and now they're going bankrupt. I did a poll earlier today about people's concerns. This kind of thing, the trans flag, the girl boss Gwen, this is the stuff that the audience is worried about now. And it's ridiculous that Hollywood has put us in that position. It is so incredibly stupid that they put that messaging crap in the trailers and they love to put these little Easter eggs and pat themselves on the back and it turns people off and it really wasn't even in the movie. This reminds me so much of the directors of Dungeons and Dragons then in their interview talking about, well, we love to emasculate men. And a lot of people are like, well, fine, I won't see your movie. And then it wasn't even in the movie. There's basically nothing in this movie that you're gonna call woke. The only big one for some of you is going to be Jessica Drew, who is now black and super pregnant. I don't read comics. I didn't even know who that was, so it didn't bug me. Other than that, they weren't slapping you with the message stuff. I don't even know if that trans flag made it into the final cut of the movie and was in Gwen's room because it wasn't the focus of the action. I did spot Miles' BLM pin, which was eye roll worthy, but they didn't draw attention to it. Gwen is not the Mary Sue girl boss of the movie. She has her self doubts. She makes a huge mistake and hates it. We got a deeper view of her character and it was a real character, but this is still Miles' story. He is the hero and this is not a bait and switch. I'm sure there were some goofy ESG Easter eggs like the trans flag and somebody's going to find them when they go through this movie frame by frame, but they were not the focus. They're not hitting you in the face and if they were there, I didn't see him. Peter's still a goof. He's wearing a pink bathrobe the entire time. He has a kid now that he's carrying around his chest. I know some people did not like the way that he was treated in the first movie. My wife is among them. She wanted to see him kind of grow out of that a little bit in this movie. For me personally, I was watching Nick Miller. The, the bathrobe, the whole bit, the voice acting. It was Nick Miller and I love him. So I loved Peter Parker. Before the next concern, I want to point out Miles is how you do a successful race swap, by the way. Yes, Miles started out as a token character and that is not even up for debate. Bait. One of the creators, Alex Alonzo, no relation to Victoria, stated that biracial Miles was influenced by the election of Obama and Alonzo's own biracial self. And yet we still have a good fleshed out character that a lot of people like. Take note, lazy writers, it can be done. He is similar enough to Peter Parker that we still get the gist, but he's different enough to still be his own thing and not just be a lazy palette swap. Yes, his uncle dies and that changes him, but it's molded to fit this new character. His uncle is now the Prowler. He gets his own Black Arican family background, which they appear to be exploring in this movie. He's dealing with the balance of charter school and being a hero. He's got father family issues to work on. It's obvious that he is based on Peter Parker, but he's been fleshed out enough that on screen anyway, he's avoiding the stupid mantle swapping crap that the MCU has been up to lately. You want representation in your movies? I think that's great. But if you're going to do it, do it right. Don't settle for a two-dimensional palette swap. I've heard some people don't like Miles in the comics. I'm not a comic guy. I like the Miles on screen. I'm also extremely excited about the new Spider-Man game coming out that's going to star Miles and Peter. If you don't see any uploads from me for like a week or two after that game releases, um... I said don't ask, I said... Another concern is that there's a fine line between fan service and meme pandering. We all saw in the trailers, they're doing the Spider-Man point thing. I'm wondering, how much are we going to be doing the... How do you do, fellow kids? I'm not a comic guy, so I probably missed some of the references and the jokes. But you know, sometimes in movies, you can really tell that there's a point where they're trying to get you to get a joke. And in this movie, there were no points where they were like, See? Look what we did! Look at this thing we're doing right here! Isn't that cool? And I still followed everything. You don't have to have picked up a comic book to get what's going on in this movie. Last concern, many people are very worried about the ending. I'm hearing that it's not a very satisfying ending, like uh, Fellowship of the Ring, somebody commented, or end of Infinity War Part 1. Supposedly, it's just, bam, black screen, wait for Part 2. And I'm really worried that that ending is going to be so jarring that that final moment is going to taint my enjoyment of the whole movie. So yes, this is a Part 1 movie, and I do feel like they should have advertised that better. It's not just a brick wall. Like, it doesn't come out of nowhere, but it is certainly a cliffhanger, and it happens right as there's a bunch of rising action, and we just got cr something crazy happens right Right at the very end and the music is getting in and you get the swell and then they cut to to be continued and right as the screen went black somebody in the theater just shouted 
What? Okay, so what's the plot here? I'll give you a general premise. I don't want to spoil too much. The idea is that there's the Spider-Verse, the multiverse, and every single Spider-Man has to have the same, a few key things happen to them, both good and bad. That's where Miguel comes in, Spider-Man 2099. He's there to ensure that the bad things are allowed to happen. Otherwise, that dimension will collapse. Miles obviously believes we don't have to let the bad things happen. So that is where their tension is coming from. Spot is a goofy villain at first, but then we get a little backstory on him. He he gets a lot stronger and by the end he is the true villain we get a little backstory on gwen we get some more family backstory with miles and his parents it worked it all worked it was so freaking good my only complaint is that somewhere around the halfway mark the setup was starting to go on too long. Gwen is back to visit Miles. They're spending time together. We're getting scenes with Miles and his family. We're getting a lot of background and setup, and it's all very important. And right as I was thinking, okay, when is this actually going to go somewhere? The movie shifts into action mode, and it does not stop. All right, so family reviews. I'll start with my wife. She did not like the way that they continued on with Peter Parker being the same from the last movie. She really wanted better from him. She wanted more character development. She wanted more screen time, really liked that character. And he's more of a side character. She loved the new characters they brought in. Spot is an incredible villain. She said she's having trouble remembering what happened throughout the film because the ending was so powerful, it erased everything else from her mind. She went with a nine or a 10. She and I share that we don't like to do the extremes. I don't feel like anything's ever perfect. So 10 out of 10 feels like that's perfect and nothing's perfect, but 9.8, how about that? My 15 year old does not share this problem. She gave it a 10 out of 10. She said the story, the characters, everything was excellent. Even the ending she said was appropriately timed and really well done. 13 year old said it was absolutely amazing. It was not just a tacked on sequel. She was really afraid that it was gonna fall into the sequel trap. She said she could not find a complaint and gave it an 11 out of 10. The 11 year old said he really liked it in general, had a great time. His only complaint was he didn't like the color changing in Gwen's world. He wasn't a big fan of the watercolor style that they put in her background. He gave it a nine out of 10. Nine year old liked it. He said it was very good and very funny. He liked the spider cat and he liked the moment with the pointing meme. He said his only complaint was he didn't like the ending. He gave it a nine out of 10 and said, had it been three or three and a half hours long just to fit all of it, instead of breaking into two movies, he would have been fine to sit through all of it. Seven-year-old liked the whole movie, gave it a nine out of 10, did not like the fact that it's broken apart and he now has to wait a really long time for part two and also thought Spot was funny. Three-year-old seemed to be entertained the entire time, only took two bathroom breaks, but did remove her shirt at one point. I don't really have a conversion chart for how to rank that. When I asked her what her favorite part was, she said, and I'm quoting, the Spider-Man. Overall, I am extremely happy with this movie. I absolutely hate giving scores because people read too much. In, I don't know, 9, 10, 9.7, 9.8. I don't know. It was really great. Here's what I think. I'm going to stop doing the scores because in my opinion, there are only three things that you really need to know about a movie. Is it a theater watch or is it a rental? Do I regret spending money on it? And would I watch it again? This is absolutely a theater watch. All of my children agree on this point. You want to go see this on a big screen. You want the theater sound experience for this one. Do I regret spending money? Absolutely not. I don't regret buying a ticket. I don't regret buying the eight tickets that I bought. And would I watch it again? Hell yes, I can't wait. And as a matter of fact, if June wasn't so busy, I would consider buying eight more theater tickets. But what are your thoughts? Are you excited to see this movie? If you have seen it, what did you think about it? I appreciate you watching and I'll see you next time.